things I would do is any edges of cabinets slash desks, etc., would need to be padded. Because uh, you don't know how many times I hit. And again, I have kind of long legs, so you know maybe that's part of it, or maybe not, I don't know. But like I just hit my knee, and I'm going to be grimacing for the rest of the class, I have a feeling, and I'll try, <laughs> I'll try not to make it too obvious. But that hurt. All right. I can't go on. That's it. Have a good week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not that bad. All right. Um, okay. Uh, if I remember where we left off last time, we were looking at a couple things. We were looking at making background images um, for our content. And <clears throat> keep in mind that you can almost have images on your web page for two reasons, right? Um, you can have images on your web page because images are another form of content, right? You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So, for example, if I was talking about, oh, let's say fixing something in, or, around the house, um, if I was thinking about, okay, replacing the bearings in your inline skate, all right, replacing the wheels on the skate. All right. I could say, well, you know, you do this, you do that, you do the other. And, well, you know, I may or may not be effective in communicating what you need to do. But a couple of pictures might go a long way in saying you take one of those, what they call hex wrenches, and you put it in there, and you turn it, and you blah, blah, blah. All right. So a picture would actually be just a different form of content then. All right. In other words, instead of just writing everything via words, I would put pictures there. And that would be another way of getting my point across. Even in this case, maybe even videos would make sense, right? Because I could actually show the process. So that's one form of images on a website. It's an additional content. It's one thing to say the Rolling Stones played to a sold out crowd in Columbus last weekend, or a couple weekends back, or whatever. Um, which I would have gone except I already have a second mortgage on my house and, and I don't think they'd let me take out a third to, uh, just to go to a concert. But um, <clears throat> It's another thing to actually show a picture of them on stage in the stadium. That conveys more information. That conveys that there was a big crowd. That, con that conveys the fact that Rolling Stones are getting up there, but yet they're still going, and so on and so forth. So images can be content on your page. Images also can be strictly for styling or aesthetic reasons. All right. Um, so background images kind of fit more in that aesthetic, creating a mood, and not really content per se. So let's look at the example we did for the online diary that I was talking about making. I had a background image on one of the paragraphs. All right. Now, in this case, that's not really content. In other words, that's not an actual picture of me suffering with my cold. All right, so you're not getting a sense of how ill I am. Um, it's not even a drawing of me, so it's not like, like, like they do in court, right? Artist depiction of, of that or something along those lines. This is just there to add a little bit of fun to the page, make it a little bit, a little cutesy and so on and so forth. All right, so it's not really content, but I will say, this graphic instantly, if you were to open this and look at it, even before you read the words, if someone asked you, this is this guy's diary, how do you think he feels today? All right, you would instantly get that. So it does convey a little bit of information, but that's not really the primary point of this. Now, there's a couple problems with this. All right, and I'm going to go and I'm going to make the, par uh, the, the, the article a little bigger so that we can see the first problem a little more, um, a little more clearly. Because you can sort of see it here and here. But really, the problem is that it's 
So if I go and make this, let's say, 500 by 650. Notice that that is, there's like a second copy of the graphic next to it. And then there's a, a, a graphic again. In other words, that background image is repeated within there. And I don't think that looks particularly good for this. All right. There's times to repeat a background image. And we'll, we'll talk about examples of that. All right. But in this case, I don't think it's a good idea to repeat the background image. So how do you eliminate the background image repeating? All right. Well, Already, even if you don't know the answer to that question, again, we haven't talked about it unless you were interested and you looked it up or whatever, or you've had experience with this, you probably don't know the answer. But you should be able to identify that this is a CSS issue. This is an issue that relates strictly to the appearance of the stuff on the page. All right? So right off the bat, you know where to look. And that's an important skill. Right? is being able to identify not necessarily exactly how to do something, but where to start looking for the answer of how to do something. So for example, if I wanted to put a video on my page, all right, is that an HTML or a CSS question? It's an HTML. Why? Because I'm talking about adding content. It used to be just words, now I want words in a video. All right. If I want this background image not to repeat, not to tile, but rather to simply appear once, that is, again, an issue of appearance. What about if I want to put these things in two columns? If I want to put the article, let's say, and this picture alongside of it. CSS or HTML issue? It's a CSS issue. That's a little bit of a trick question. Because you could probably figure out something to do HTML, but that would be the wrong way to do it. All right? And we'll talk more about that later on. So anything that re relates to the physical layout of it, or how it looks, is typically going to be a CSS issue. All right? We can't possibly cover every single CSS attribute and every single HTML uh, uh, tag and attribute. But if you sort of got a sense of what each of these two languages is responsible for, then you, we don't need to cover that because as you need to do something, you can look it up. So in this case, I'm going to go to, let's say, W3Schools. I, I, I really wonder, like, search engine usage. My guess is that 90% of people use Google for their search engine, and the 10% that don't use Google for their search engine are people that their browser defaulted to Bing, and they either don't want to change the default, or they don't know how to change the default. Because really, I mean, why would you use Bing to search for I don't know. I digress. All right. I could look under here and look under CSS. And CSS backgrounds, right? That seems to be what we're talking about here. All right. CSS property is used for background effects. Background color, background image, background repeat, background attachment, background position. Which of these attributes seems to be the relevant one? Repeat. All right. So let's look up that and see what background repeat is. All right, that gives us the ability to repeat horizontally or vertically. So, or both. So if I put in no repeat into my CSS, repeat, colon, no repeat, then that should take care of my problem.
now if I go and refresh this page, <laughs> doesn't work at all. I see what I did. Just put no repeat. There we go. All right. We only get the one copy of the image. All right. Question. Not too many things open. Why is this on red background? Let's see if we can reason through that and come up with a solution. Why is that red? Exactly. So we told the we told the background not to repeat. So here is our article. Boom. We told the background to be this image, which it did, and we told it not to repeat. When we didn't, when we had the repeat turned on, it went and it filled up the rest of the space with a portion of the image. Now we told it not to repeat. So in other words, there's no background for this. Well, what do we know about CSS when there is no background? It gets the background of its parent. So it gets the background of red. How can I fix this? I could make the article size closer to match the picture. That's true. That's one way. Another way is I could put a background color on here. So it's like I'm going to paint that area white. Then I'm going to put that image in there. And any place where that image doesn't cover, the white's going to show through instead of the red's going to show through. So if I do that, then we should be back in business. There we go. I have to admit, I, that, that threw me for a loop at first. I, I didn't realize what was going on, but, you know, because it's early, but hey, I, I thought about it for a second, and we're back in business. Now, let's notice something, and let's say if you're, if you're watching closely, you'll notice that I did something a little different than they did on the W3 school site. And let me, let's, 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 Let's copy this background piece, just this background piece, into its own file. So I have something like that. I have the word background URL, cold JPEG, space, white, space, no repeat. On the W3 school site, they have this, which again, I'll, I'll make it match mine with the same values. So on the W3 school site, they use sort of this style. And I use this style to represent the background. All right? Which is right. Well, they both work, so they're both right. It's just a different way of doing it. This is sort of a shorthand for doing this. In other words, if you look at the article, uh, if you look at the, the style... Um, that the way that the W3 schools did it, each one of these attributes start with the word background. Background dash image. Background dash repeat. Background, that should be dash color. All right. 
So background itself is a property that has a bunch of little sub-properties. All right? Background. <coughs> it can be an image that's part of the background. Whether that image repeats or not is a property of the background. And what the color is is part of the background. In the case of shorthand properties, you can either put each property out individually, like they've done here, background image, this, background repeat, this, background color, this. Or you can simply put the main attribute or the main property name, like background, and give the values all as part of one line. All right? It's kind of a shorthand. Right? This is more concise. Now, the trick of this is, and this is actually kind of clever, the folks that designed um, CSS. The trick of this is, is it doesn't matter what order I put these in. It's going to work. Well, how does the browser know that this is meant to be the background image, this is meant to be the color, this is meant to be whether it repeats or not? Well, there's no color called no repeat, right? By putting a URL and the file name in quotes, that's pointing to a file. So the browser knows, hey, when I point to a file, the only possible thing it could be is a background image. It's not a background color, it's a background image. This is the name of a color. So it knows, well, this person must mean the background color. So these attributes, the browser's smart enough to look at these attributes when you use the shorthand method and, and know what each piece of it means. It's not going to think that white relates to whether it's repeated or not, right? That doesn't make sense. White's clearly a color. So, okay, that must be the background color that they want. Or you can specify it explicitly here. Another area that that comes into are things such as margins and padding. In other words, I could say this. Oops. I could say margin 10px. Or I could say actually a margin, there's four margins, a top, right, bottom, and left. Or I could say margin top 10px. Margin right, margin bottom, and margin left. Again, these things say the same thing. In this case, I explicitly say, and I separate them, margin top, margin right, bottom, and left. In this case, I give one number. So the browser's smart enough to know, well, if I just gave one margin number, I must want that margin for all four margins, margin top, right, left. Sometimes I don't want the exact same number, and I might say margin top is 10, margin right is 20, margin bottom is 10, Margin left is 20. So I might have, for example, um, you know, I want more margin on the sides than I do on the top. All right? I can do that with the shorthand property by saying this. So I can give two numbers. Well, how does it know what margins get those two numbers? Right? Well, It starts assigning the margins at the top in a clockwise way. So if I say margin 10px, 20px, it starts, it says, okay, there's four margins, top, right, bottom, and left. Well, first number is 10px, so the top will be 10px. The bottom will be 20. It then starts around again and says the bottom is going to be 20, the left's going to be, or I'm sorry, the bottom's going to be 10, the left is going to be 20. All right. 
I bring this up not to confuse you. In one of my classes, one of my students said, why do you show us ten different ways to do something? Just show us one way and be done with it. Well, yeah, there's merit to that in some cases, right? Um, however, keep in mind that you're liable to be working with other, another person on a project, and they're liable to have a preference to do it one way. Or you're liable to be reading in a book or seeing on a website. And so I, I at least want you to be aware that there's other ways to represent when there's multiple properties. So I can either say margin top, margin left, margin right, margin bottom, or I can simply say margin and then it does the clockwise thing. And that's the same thing with background. So me, being lazy, typically go with the shorthand. So I usually use this sort of syntax. And again, I remember that this is how you do a URL, this is how you do a color, this is how you do the repeat. All right? And the browser's smart enough to know which of those properties are, really regardless of what order they're in. Questions? If this portion was confuse, confusing to you, the shorthand property business, um, don't worry about it. It'll come clear as you get more practice. Yes? Uh -huh. Right. Right. No. All right. Let's look at this and let's figure out. Here's my page. All right. In my page, the background of this is partially the image, partially the color white. I don't see a seam, right? Because the background, the, the, the image is white and uh, the background is also white. If I made this, for example, yellow, that's the wrong file. If I made this yellow instead, all right, that part's the image. That part's the color. Where does it get the black from? Yes? I've seen the same thing. Uh huh. But there's two different selectors a background selector and a color selector. Right. There, there's, right. There, there, is a, there is a color, um, and then there's a background color. It is smart enough to know that if it's part of the background, if I indicate a color, associated with the background that it refers to the background color. All right? The color of the text is what property? It's the color property. All right? Right. So this is a section. The color for this area, and color means the color of the text, is going to be black. All right? Boom. So we're going to have black text in this, in this article. The background is going to have a URL background. It's going to have a background image of cold. Where the image doesn't get to, the background is going to be yellow. And I'm not repeating the image, so I'm not tiling the image. Okay? Now, um, great question. Let's, let's move that back to white. Um, that's one strategy I take both like when I'm teaching and when I'm debugging my own code. If something doesn't look the way that I expect it to, I change like the colors to be like wild colors, you know, so that I can see at a glance what's happening, right? You know, if uh, your article is one shade of red and your background for the page is another shade of red, it might not be clear like what's going on. But if I make one of them purple and the other one green, stuff is going to stick out a lot more vividly. So that's one strategy for debugging if stuff doesn't work out the way that you want. Give everything like a, a crazy background color, a different background color, and, and stuff tends to stand out. So here's where we are with this. Let me 
say that? All right. So we got rid of that issue of the tiling. What we still have, though, is the issue of this text doesn't, isn't readable against this background image. Now, keep in mind that maybe the answer would be, well, don't use a background image then. All right. Background images are one of those things that if they're done effectively and if they're done with some discretion, they can be great. They can really make the page look good and, and so on. <coughs> if they're not done well, they can make for a mess. All right? So, if I were doing this for real, I probably would just get rid of the background image at this point and say, well, no, we'll just, we'll just have a white background. But if I want to work my way through this and make this background image work, what could I do? to make it work so that I can read the text against the background image. Right. One thing you could do is you could make the image faint. In other words, make it like a watermark. And again, this isn't a class in digital image manipulation, but every web developer should know some like real basics about image manipulation. So we'll take a look at that. What's another possibility of, of something that we could do? It's probably like two possibilities. Might be others, but there's two pretty obvious ones. Yes? Um, I could possibly bump the text down so that that background image and the text did not overlap. Okay. So I, that's, that's actually not the second one that I had in mind, but that is another good valid one. The other thing I could do is I could play with the color of this. In other words, yeah, black sort of doesn't show up good against his brown hair, but if I made it red, you're right, I did that wrong. Thank you. I did that to see if you were looking. You guys passed today. Good job. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. All right. Now, I could do a few things. I could fiddle with the color until I got a color that worked against that. The one issue, though, is, is with an image, you know, most images are going to show um, you know, are going to have a lot of colors in them. So, no matter what you do, if you have a picture of a, uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of, a of a of a beach, let's say, all right, and you can imagine there might be the blue of the water, the the light tan of the sand. There might be some shadows in it. And there might be the blue of the sky and the white of the clouds. All right. What color would you use? Well, if you'd use blue, it wouldn't really show up against the areas where there's the, the blue sky and uh, the water. If I used white, it wouldn't show up well against the clouds. If I used black, it wouldn't show well up against uh, the um, shadows and so on. So if you're dealing with like a, a, an image, a photograph that has a lot of colors in it, it sometimes you, you know, there's no good choice that you could make. Now, if you're dealing like with a logo, maybe that only has a couple of colors. If I was doing something, let's say and I put the Coca-Cola logo, I was doing Coca-Cola's web page. Well, there may only be two colors in that, right? Um, you know, red and, and white. So yeah, I could use black as a color and it's going to show up pretty good. Or I could use blue or, or whatever. The other thing is to make it like a watermark and by fading it. Now, a lot of this depends on what tool that you have. I'm going to use Microsoft Paint, not because it's a good image editor, but because um, it's one that is available on most, on every Windows machine. So let me go in here and open it with Paint. And really what I'm going to do is, good question. A 
okay, this is not a test. I'm not sure how to do this. Can I do this in paint? Well, I don't want to do transparency. I just want to play with the brightness. Yeah. Job free fire. I don't want to do that. Maybe you can't do this in paint. Let's uh, let's see what else we have here. Huh? But first, we'll play some calming music for you. Oh, you have to be able to do this in paint, unless it was in an older version. Paint, adjust brightness and contrast. Where, how can I adjust bright and contrast on a picture? Recently installed Windows 7 directions say open paint, open picture, and click on adjustments. At this point, the person gets very angry typing in this message. I have no option to click on adjustments. All right. This person says paint is not what you need. Try installing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I guess you can't do this via paint. Um, let's see if there's an online tool. Online image editing. Yeah, I don't. I, I really don't want to like sit here waiting, you know, for stuff to download and all that. Well, let's go and do this. Let's upload. Oh, choose file. There we go. Um, let's go and upload this guy. All right, there we go. There's my image. And I can go into color change. That's what I want, I think, or not. So I can add glitter text, but I can't change the contrast. This is not my day. All right, here we go. And if I go image. Adjustment. There we go. Brightness and contrast. Now, a watermark essentially is, in terms of images, something that is bright with not much contrast. That's going to give it sort of a washed out look. See, if I make this high contrast, it makes all the things more vivid. If I make this brighter and lower the contrast,
there you can just sort of see the suggestion of it, and it's like a watermark. There's probably a few ways that you could do this. Actually, if I make it very high contrast, well, it looks all white. That would be a way to get around having the problem seeing the image. If I make no contrast, let's say OK, and there we go, OK. And then I can save this. I am going to simply overwrite that. I know I gave the big lecture last time about keeping the original, but it seems hardly worth it in this case. And now I go and look at this, and ah, there we go. So I'm just giving sort of a suggestion of the image behind that. May have gone a little bit too far. Let me go and make the color back to black. All right. And there I'm, I'm sort of back in business kind of the way that I wanted this to be. All right. Yay. Couple of things I want to do with background images before I get into when I would want to tile an image. Let's see. I want to cover tiling an image. I want to cover IDs and classes. I want to cover different directories. And then I want to cover um, start on the project. So, four things. All right. One thing that can be done effectively on websites is, let me sketch it out. And this gets rid of sort of the problem of the text against the, the background. One thing you'll see many sites do is something like this. You have your page. You have a content area that does not fill up the whole page. All right? And this typically will be like, you know, a, a solid color black background like white or whatever. All right? I then I'm going to pick a background image that's going to fill that little gap between the edge of the window and the content. In reality, what I have is I have a background image that fills the entire window. But then I overlay on top of that a content area that has a solid color. The result of that is you sort of have like a little, almost like a picture frame. All right, your content is in the middle. You have then, going around the outside, some nice pattern. And you can even do this with an actual image as opposed to a pattern. Sometimes what I see done in really some cool websites is you actually make this not a solid color but partially transparent. So you can see sort of the image peeking out from underneath it. Um, we won't do that today, but we will do the bit of picture framing that. Now, we noticed before that if I have an image and I don't specify the repeat and I use it as a background, it tiles it. In other words, let's say I have a window that's this big. And let's say I have a background image that's this big. If I don't specify no repeat, if I just let it repeat or tile, 
it's going to go and it's going to copy that image going horizontally and vertically until it fills the whole window, this part included. Now, has any of you ever put like paneling or wallpaper or floor tiles? No? That you could do some clever stuff with this if you have the right kind of tile. Alright? Because what you could do actually is let's make draw a real simple tile design. My tile looks like this. If one of my tiles, let's imagine that's not a solid line, but so I'll draw it as a dash line. If my tile's designed in a certain way, if it's like symmetric over both axes, the horizontal and the vertical, then if I tile these together, they're going to sort of interlock to form a pattern. All right? And it's easier to do it with these kind of things than it is with flooring or wallpaper or whatever. You don't have to worry about like making the cut even or anything. It does it for you. So you can actually go and find background tiles like this and put them on your web page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what we had, well, I'm going to take what we had uh, so far and I'm going to add to it a background image that tiles um, everything. So, you can actually make your own tiles and, and if you're interested like in, in doing graphic uh, work and, and image manipulation, it's not that hard to do. Or we can go and we can download a tile. It's actually a background tile generator. Let's play with that. Now, nah, what's that? Let's try this one. Yeah, let's try this one. There we go. This is kind of showing us what this pattern looks like. And again, I can make the pattern stronger, that is a higher contrast, or more washed out. And there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do with this too. Let's pick this one. Yeah, there we go. And we can set the color here. I keep forgetting it looks different on the screen than it does. It looks different up there on the screen. Some of these things, like that last pattern, didn't really look like a pattern, I don't think. There you can see it's a grid. Now I'm going to click here, Download Background Image. And it's giving me a PNG file. Did it put it? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to cut this. Put it on my desktop. If I look at this, it's just one tiny little image. All right. When we viewed it in this, it covers the whole screen. Why? Because it's tiled. Those things are lined up just like I did up there. 
so that they form a pattern. And this is a very simple pattern, just a pattern of diamonds, but you can put little curly cues in there and all that, and you can make for a more involved pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this as a background for my entire page. So I'm going to say background black. Actually, I don't need a background color, so I'm going to make this repeat all the way across. So I'll say URL. And the name of the file is ABDC. I'm going to, the name of this file is background or tile. All right. It is a PNG file. Notice that, again, it says PNG. I've turned file extensions on so I can see exactly what kind of file it is. All right. Um, it's important to do that because we've used so far JPEG files largely in this class, but a file could be, an image file could be a JPEG file, could be a GIF file, or it could be a PNG. So it's important to have your file extensions enabled so you can see exactly what kind of file it is. Now notice that this is 35 by 35 pixels. 454 bytes. That's a tiny file. Tiny, tiny, tiny file. So, this isn't going to add much to like the download of this page. It's, it's negligible how much extra time is going to add to that. One thing you do have to be aware of a little bit, and again, I know that people have much faster internet connections than they used to, but you don't want to have too many gigantic background images because that can slow things down. But what I'm trying to point out in this case is that's not really going to be an issue here. So I'll put in the background. The URL is tile.png. I'll save this. No, I won't. Save this and refresh. And there you see my background covers the whole screen. So with a 454 byte with a tiny, tiny, tiny file, I have a background for all of it. Now, we did lose a few things like my diary doesn't really appear well here and so on. Um, so what I can do is I can go in via CSS and say, okay, let's make the background color of the H1 white. Now, one thing I said I wanted to do is I wanted to center this, all right? Because this doesn't look bad, but it doesn't look particularly good either. So what I want to do is I want to make sort of a block that's centered on the middle of my page, all right? I can do that simply by giving everything the same width and by using margins to give it an even margin on the right and left. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say with 600 pixels, margin, zero pixels, auto. What does that mean? Again, I've given two values for the margin. Zero is the top, auto is the right, zero is the bottom, auto is the left. Auto means to center it, figure out the exact thing so and center it. So I'm going to make both my articles and my H1, 600 pixels wide. And 
Oh, I forgot to put the margin on the article. There we go. Why isn't that guy centered? Not part of the article, right. Um, so what I probably should do is that probably should be in one of my HTML5 structural things. In this case, I have just a figure at the bottom. Probably it should appear either in its own section or whatever. I'm going to use an aside simply because we haven't used, I don't think, an example of an aside yet. What does an aside mean? It means that, well, it's kind of related to the topic, but it's not really, it's sort of a, a side thought. It's sort of an additional thought. So if we're thinking about this, if I have an article, all right, about what my day is, or what my day was like on 623, sort of a side thought is, oh yeah, by the way, it's this guy's birthday, who's one of my favorite soccer players. It's not really like, doesn't directly relate to what kind of day I'm having, but it's sort of related, all right? Like again, I mentioned like if they had an article about the Cavaliers in the playoffs. Sorry to bring back these sad, sad memories. I know you were just, you were just almost over that, right? And I brought it up and brought it back to your attention. I apologize. But they could have a, a, an article about how games such and such went, and a side might be a little story about who sang the national anthem. Right? It's related to it. I mean, it's still about the game, but it's not like the main point of the article. The main point of an article is not about who performed the national anthem, but it's about, you know, the results of it. <laughs> but the only exception is I, <laughs> I don't know, you, Thursdays are sort of like my Fridays, so I kind of like have that weekend fever going on already. All right? But the only exception I can think of that is I attended some Oberlin, Oberlin College sporting events. And in that, it's just the opposite. The performance of the national anthem is way better than what their sports teams do. Because <laughs> right? again, small liberal arts college with a world-class conservatory, yeah, they got better musicians and they got athletes there. All right, That's probably a safe bet. And I'm sure if anyone is listening to that, uh, they're not going to disagree too hard. All right, but it's amazing. It's like, uh, you know, usually you, you kind of go and, and sometimes you're interested, sometimes you're not, but I heard some, like, amazing performances. My daughter went to Oberlin College, so I, I attended some of their sporting events. Anyhow, getting back to this, I'm going to go in and set the style for my aside. And I'm actually going to make the, the width a little less wide. All right? Why? Well, again, it's sort of a side-related issue. All right? Huh. Didn't really do what I wanted it to do, huh? Let's take a look here. A sign I make the width that. Make the well, I deliberately want to make it smaller than 600. All right. But notice that. Well, let's make it 100 another thing you can do sometimes with CSS is go to extremes to see what the effect has. Sometimes that teaches you stuff. That had no impact. Why do you think it had no impact? Well, it kind of did, right? Because looky down here, the caption, happy birthday from. Well, the reason it didn't have an impact is what? 
It is. You're, you're making some great observations. And this is exactly the path you go troubleshooting. Let's think of how I want to troubleshoot this further, though. First of all, I'm going to put a background color on that aside. So I'll put a background color of yellow. Interesting. Well, that makes sense, right? You're chuckling, so maybe it doesn't make sense. Let's see what we did here. I said the width is 100 pixels. Yeah, that sure looks like 100 pixels. Margin, 0 pixels auto. That kind of looks centered. So, auto, auto, centered it. What's the problem, though? Problem is, this image doesn't fit within its container. Right? How big is that image? I don't know how big that image is. How can I find that out? Well, I can go and mouse on it and say properties. That might tell me. It is 650 pixels wide. Well, here's an important aspect of CSS. I actually asked the CSS and the HTML to do something that's impossible. I asked to make the image, make a 650 pixel image fit inside uh, an area that's only 100 pixels wide. So what does a browser do? It takes a shot at it. It does something. In this case, it says, well, I don't want to cut off this image. I'm going to put this image there, and I'm going to have the image actually go outside of the width of that. Well, okay, 100 pixels is ridiculous. But let's say I want to make this 400 pixels. So I could make it 400 pixels. What I could do then is... And again, I could probably address this any number of ways. But for now, I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit this. And I'm going to make this 400 pixels wide. And I'm going to save it. Ah, so now that looks kind of the way that I want to. I can go in here and get rid of that background if I want. And yeah, that kind of looks getting to be the way I want it to be. Again, the idea isn't specifically what I'm doing. The idea is trying to teach the troubleshooting techniques and trying to show you um, like things that you can do um, and principles of how the browser works. That's a principle of a browser. Unless you tell it to, it's never going to cut off any, any content. So I could, I could specify an area as being only 200 pixels, but if there's a 500 pixel wide image in it, it's going to show the whole picture. All right. Questions on what we have so far? Yes? Right. 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 
Okay. All right. You're not seeing a difference. I love that you used that word, that you're not seeing a difference, as opposed to I'm not noticing a difference. All right. Subtle difference, but it really helps prove my point. What does it mean when you say, how could you see a difference? Yes. I'm asking you or anyone else in a class. What would be one way that I could see a difference between that? Yeah. How could I make it so that they do look different? How, I guess that's my question. I'm clarifying my own thoughts and questions. How could I make it so that the difference between an aside and a article were visible to someone? Okay, the placement. All right. What else? What else could I do? I could make it smaller. Right? I could place it somewhere different. I could have all the articles going down the center of the screen, having the sides off to the side. Right? I could make a smaller area. I could use smaller fonts. I could use different color, um, um, different color backgrounds, different color fonts, different fonts. I could put a border around them. All right. My point is, is what are all these things? that I've described, what language do they belong in? Do they belong in CSS or do they belong in, in HTML? Well, defining that this is an aside, this is an article, takes place within HTML. Describing how visually, how you can see the difference between an article and an aside is a question for CSS. So, in other words, how could I make the aside, how could I make it give the user a visual hint that this aside is different, I'm going to do it via CSS. The reason that you can't see the difference is because I didn't go and really put much of a difference in there in the style code. Let's go now and put some differences in there. Why use inside side versus an article? Well, again, let's imagine, let's imagine that I'm developing a website. All right? And I'm, I'm creating, all right, I, I, I get what you're, where you're coming from now. I'm creating a website, and it's a news website, you know, or a sports website, or something like that, that's going to have a lot of articles, and it's going to have some asides. All right? So, it's just like any, you know, you pick up a magazine, again, it might have um, an article about the Indians game tonight, it might have an aside about the stadium that they're playing in, it's a new stadium or whatever. It might have another article about uh, a golf tournament, have an aside about what the weather forecast is there. So I know that there's going to be main articles and asides. So there's stuff that's real important, there's stuff that isn't important. Well, having the two tags allows me to say, I'm going to create a CSS rule that is going to make all my articles big, pushed to the left. I'm going to make my asides smaller and pushed to the right. Something like this. So I could write CSS. We haven't gone over how to do this, but I think it's easier to, to see what we've done and extend it. But I could take and say, all right, CSS, I can write the CSS to do this, along with any other visual things. Maybe the colors are different, the fonts are different, and so on. So I'm developing a new page. All right. All I have to do as a web developer, all right, is I have a new article that is going to appear. Uh, Dwayne Wade decides to come to Cleveland as an article, right? I put it in a tag as article because that's a big deal. I then have an article that says, well, LeBron James... Um, 
has a charity golf tournament. Well, it's not quite as important. So that's going to belong into a, an aside. So when I create the content of the page, I look at the content and I classify, in this particular case, and you could extend this for other cases, but in this case I look at all my content and I make the decision. Is this like a real important article or is this like kind of a side article, less important? All I have to do then is tag them as such. It would be like if you had your textbook and I said, this is going to be on the final, this is something that's important for your project, right? You would somehow indicate differently, hey, this is for my final, so when it comes time to study for my final, I better look at this, when, and this is something for my project. When I get around to doing my project, I better pay attention to this, all right? Now, once I've identified these, and, and again, what's the purpose of tags? It's to describe as completely as you can the content. So here I've described the content. In other words, if I have a paragraph here and a paragraph here, these two paragraphs aren't equal conceptually. One of them is more important than the other. The paragraph in the article, by the way, I'm defining these and using these, is more important than the than the content that's in the aside. So, all I have to do is create these things and put them in based on their relative importance. The CSS file will now go and do this. Now, someone else comes along and says, hey, I don't want to show it this way. Alright? I want to do this. I want to have my articles take up 100% of the width of the page. So go all the way across. And then I want my less important articles to be sort of stacked in a grid like this. So. This is one way that we could visually represent the difference between an article and a side. Is have articles bigger aligned to the left, asides smaller and aligned to the right. A different way we could represent it is this way. Now here's where the nice thing comes in. Think of what it would take to change the website from looking like this to looking like that. I've already identified in me at my HTML code. This is an article. This is important. This is an aside. It's less important. All I have to do then is go and change my CSS pay, uh, file to achieve this layout instead of this layout. So what I've done effectively is I've separated the content from the presentation. And you'll hear me say that a lot in web developing. And you'll hear that a lot in other kinds of programming as well. I'm treating the content that is the, the guts of it, all right, the, 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 the most important aspects of it, you know, the content, the meaning, I've separated from the way it looks. I can then go and style it any way I want to, to visually make it clear to the user. And I can do that without touching the HTML. So I have a site that has 50 pages worth of news stories on it, some of which are articles and asides. I can go from this layout to this layout without touching any one of those 50 and simply by changing the CSS. All I have to do is, when I create the page, identify what's an important article, what's a side article. Then I let the styling do the rest. If we extend that thought a little bit more, all right, how does a mobile con screen compare to a desktop? machine. Mobile screen is smaller than a desktop. So when you go to a mobile website, do you want to see all the information that's on the desktop site? Usually not. So guess what I could do? If I had a mobile version of this, and this works out well because the mobile version is smaller than the other two. Guess what I could do? I could only change 
or I could create a CSS file to only show the main articles, right? If I'm browsing my hypothetical site on my mobile device, all I want to know is did the Cavs win or not? Win or not? I'm probably not that interested in who sang the national anthem or the history of the, the arena that they're playing in or any of these other side articles. So, if we identify in the HTML not just the content, but the significance of the content, how we view that content conceptually, we can then go and we can style it and get the look that we want. All right? If, for example, and again, sometimes a good way to answer these questions is to think about what if we did it some other way? All right? What if we made it so that each one of these was articles? I said, you know, what if I said to myself, yeah, aside, I never remember that one. And, and a lot of times I do forget that one when I do the lectures, all right? So I'm not even going to get, I'm not even going to mess with that. I'm just going to make everything an article. Because everything is an article, right? Uh, the biography of the person saying the national anthem is an article, all right? Could I get this look? Yes, I could. Again, we haven't talked about how to do that. We will in a minute or, or two. We'll, we'll start to talk about that. But essentially, you would get that by putting in IDs and classes. Or class equals less important, or whatever. So I could accomplish this by simply going in and putting a class or an ID or something like that to, to designate that this article is different in importance than this other article. I could do that, but it's going to make my job a little harder. It's going to make me work a little harder and there's always a potential for a mistake of some kind or if I need to change something for it not to go as well or whatever. All right. So, could we do this without... Could we achieve these sorts of visual effects only by using the article tag? Yes. What's the difference then of using the article tag by itself versus the article on the aside, it will make our life easier and will make our design more flexible if we completely describe the significance of the content by saying this is a main article, this is an aside. All right. Again, keep in mind, the better that you describe your content, the more specific and the more detailed that you describe your content, because that's what tags are, right? They're a description of your content. The better and more thorough job you do describing that, the better and easier you can style it, the better the browser can do certain things for you automatically, all right, and so on. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Um, the abbreviation tag that we said before, that we, we talked about last time, right? You could write a paragraph that says the WHO, blah, 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 and you would not have to use an um, abbreviation tag to designate that. But if you do use the abbreviation tag, you, get the, you have described your content more thoroughly, and you get the benefit of being able to, in the browser, put your mouse over it and see the definition of that abbreviation. All right? Another example, what is another example? Um, I, I lost my train of thought on this. It's something that we saw recently. Huh. Yeah, that, I, I'm not sure if that's the one, but that's another example of this sort of thought. All right. The more thoroughly that you do that, the, the, you can take advantage of features of the browsers, you can create styles that work easier, and um, again, the more flexibility you have to do these things. All right?
Okay, and this, that's a great question. And you know what? Here's like... How do I want to say this? Here is like the, the bottom line, sort of. And this is sort of like a good news thing. <laughs> All right? That I can tell you theoretically this is the best way to do this. But you know what? If you did it the other way and made everything articles and used IDs and classes, it's really not that big of a deal. It just makes your life a little harder. All right? And it, it, it's easier to, to use the, that in the way that it was intended. All right? Then, then the browser, assistive technologies can make more sense of it, and so on. Now, back in the old days, any of you that did pre-HTML5 uh, coding, what did you use for everything here? You used a div. All right? Could you do something like this? Absolutely. But you'd have to use divs in combination with IDs and classes. And not to say you couldn't do this, it just makes your life a little harder. These new HTML5 tags really allow you to do some of the things that you used to have to struggle with a little bit, do a little bit easier. Yes? Repeat, please. Div is division. It's a, it's a div tag. And in HTML4, there was no such thing as header, article, section, um, aside, nav, footer. Div filled all those roles. There was one tag that you would use for all those things, and then you would add an ID and class and so on to make it, look, make it serve the role that you wanted it to. So really, that's one of the big advantages of HTML5. Now, I mentioned IDs and classes, all right? Let's make a today's diary entry. And you can still probably hear that I have a cold, right? But I don't feel that bad. I feel pretty good, all right? So we're going to pretend that I'm completely better, all right? Because it makes for a better example. I'm going to go in here in my diary, and I'm going to make my entry for today. No, you have to guess what I'm doing. Do I have to do everything for you? We've been in this class for three weeks already and you can't read my mind yet? Come on. Alright, no. Good point. I'll put the screen. I'll even pull the screen down so you don't have to read it through the writing. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to make my article for today. June 25th. Actually, I want to put this on top. It probably makes more sense for a diary to be most recent to least recent. So I'm going to put this up on the top. All right, June 25th. So, there's my paragraph, and I'll keep a paragraph of Greek text in there just to um, make it more interesting. All right? So, I'll go here. Drum roll, please. I view it. What's wrong with this picture? Well, I still got the background image on this entry of me being deathly ill with a cold in the, in the bed with taking my temperature and with my teddy bear and Kleenexes and so on. Despite the fact that the text says I feel pretty good and I'm going to take a long bike ride. What's wrong with this picture? Why is it this way, first of all? Why is it that that background image is on this article, even though I feel well? Yes, how I defined articles to look. Let's look at my CSS. My CSS says article, color black, background URL, blah, 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 blah. 
All right. What that means is, what is the selector in that CSS rule? The selector is article, an HTML tag of article. What does that mean? That means that every article on the page gets this rule. All right. Well, clearly, I probably don't want that background image on every one of my articles. When would I want that background image to appear? Well, I might want to put, have that background image appear on every entry where I had a cold, right? But I don't want it to appear on the entries that I feel good. So let's make another entry. Let's retroactively make an entry for yesterday. I'm going to say I'm still not feeling well, blah, blah, blah. Go and save this. Look at that. Well, that background image makes sense here, because I'm talking about that I don't feel good. Background image makes sense here, because I'm still not feeling well. Background image doesn't make sense here, because I feel fine. At least, we're pretending I do. All right. So what can I do? Clearly, I don't want that to appear on every article. Yet the, my CSS rule is set up to make that image appear that way for every article. Make the background appear that way for every article. What I need is I need a, you know, I need a finer brush. I don't want to paint all my articles the same way. I want to paint some of my articles one way and some of my articles another way. I can't do that with just HTML selectors. With an HTML selector, it's going to apply it to all tags of that type. What I want to do is, the days I don't feel good, I want to use that as a background image. The days when I feel fine, I don't. So here's what I'm going to do. Let me go and do it, and then we'll talk about why it worked the way it did. I am going to duplicate this article rule. And I'm going to put dot cold. Alright, and then I'm going to remove the background URL from articles so that no longer will every article have that as a background image. Now we're not there yet, but I'm going to show you what we have so far. Alright, we've sort of succeeded. We got rid of that background image on June 25th century, but we did not get rid of it on these two entries. Or we did get rid of it where we want it for those two entries. I need a way to specify that some articles get this and some articles don't. Now there's two ways that you can do that. You can do that with IDs and you can do that with classes. What's the difference between an ID and a class? An ID uniquely identifies an element on the page. When I say uniquely, it means that there's only one. You think of any sort of ID, you know, your social security card, your driver's license, your library card, your student ID card here. All those are going to have some kind of ID number on them, right? And how many people have that same ID number for that ID, that kind of ID? just you. All right? It would not make sense for two people to have the same ID number on their student ID. Right? 
or the same ID number on their library card. Well, you know, who do we collect the overdue fee from? You know, person A who has an ID number of 123 or person B who has an ID number of 123. Uh, Our records show that ID 123 has an overdue book. All right, who do I send the bill to? I don't know. There's two or three people that have that. That wouldn't work, right? An ID number needs to uniquely identify something. On the other hand, a class is where you describe things that could be more than one, but share some characteristic. So, for example, all right, um, there could be a event that is just for CSS, CISS majors. All right. Does that mean only one person is going to show up? No, because there's more than one CISS major. All right? It's not an event specifically for student number one, two, three. It's an event for anyone that belongs in that category of CISS major. And more than one person certainly can belong into that. In CSS terms and HTML terms, what I've just described is a class, a class of people, a group of people. All right? You can tell something is a class if it starts with a dot in the CSS rules. So, I've no longer said that I want every article to have that background image. I've said the things that have a class of cold, I want to have that background image on. Well, I, for this to work, I have to go in and I have to identify which of those elements belong to the class of diary entry on a day that I had a cold. And we're going to say this one does. And we're going to say this one does. So what we've accomplished here is we're now looking at this with, you know, a finer tooth comb. We're not saying every article we want to look this way. We're saying every article that has been assigned a class of cold. What's the selector look like when I use a class? It starts with a dot. So dot cold means anything on this page that has a class of cold will get this style rule. Notice that's more subtle than what we had before. What we had before is every article gets this style. So literally, 100% of articles would get that style. Now I can fine tune it and say, well, I don't want every article, just those articles who has a class of cold. So now if I look at it, So look, feeling good today, I don't have that background image. This day I'm sick, and this day I'm sick, I do have that background image. Now I could do something if I wanted to for defining you know, five or six different kinds of classes, right? That indicate what kind of day I had. I could have a workday class, you know. Today I went to work, or today I'm talking about my work, you know. Gee, I had a good lecture in CIS this 216 a day. I could have an outdoors activity one where I had a picture of trees as my background or bicycling one where I had a picture or a, a art, a clip art of someone on a bike or whatever. So what I've done with this is I'm fine tuning and I'm saying I don't want everything that has an article that, or that is in an article tag to have the style rule. I just want those things to have a class of cold. That's a class. All right? An ID needs to be unique. So let's look at my HTML. 
this aside here. <coughs> Let's say this fellow, whoever it is, is my absolute favorite soccer player. How many favorite soccer players can you have? It's one, right? Even if you think you have two, there's always one you're going to like a little more. All right? So, I can give an ID of this to favorite soccer player. Birthday. So I'm describing that this relates to my favorite soccer player's birthday. I can then go and give us give a style associated with that ID. And whereas classes begin with a period, IDs begin with a pound sign, hashtag, tic-tac-toe thing whatever your favorite way of putting it is. So I can then give a style rule to this element based on ID. Because it's an ID, I can only have one of them. I can only have one favorite soccer player birthday article. All right? And I can do something like border orange five pixel dotted. We haven't covered border yet, but it's pretty easy to imagine. This, by the way, is one way that I plan on going over some CSS stuff, is as the need sort of organically appears in class to talk about it. So now I go and look at this. All right. This article gets the style rule associated with article because it doesn't have an ID, doesn't have a class or anything like that. This gets what style IDs or so what what style rules? Well, it's an article, but specifically it's an article of class cold. So actually, the cascading part kicks in. It gets this piece of its style from the article style rule. It gets this piece of its style from the article, I'm sorry, from the cold class. Same thing with this one. This didn't work. Why not? Favorite soccer player birthday. Order. I forget to save it. There, I forgot to save it. And there we go. Might be a little hard to see. Let me go and let me put a background on this. Again, I'm going to make the background color obviously different so it really stands out. And there we go. So we now have a finer set of brushes, if you will. All right? We can define CSS rules based on the HTML tag. We can define CSS rules based on the class. And we can define CSS rules based on an ID. The difference between an ID and a class conceptually is that an ID needs to be unique. There should only be one thing on a page for a given ID. A class does not need to be unique. There could be multiple things on the page with the same class. I then assign the class to the different elements by simply saying, 
class equals and the name. Just as I can put an ID for favorite soccer player birthday. And then in the style rule, I define classes with a period before the name of the class, IDs with a pound sign before it. Now notice that I picked descriptive names for this. I picked cold, I picked favorite sour player birth, favorite soccer player birthday. I didn't say orange border, orange border green background for that ID. Why? Well, that's always going to be my favorite soccer player's birthday, but I may choose to visually represent it in a way different than having dotted orange polka dots going around it in a green back background. So your names of your style, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the names of your class and IDs should reflect like why you created that class. What does that class represent as opposed to how I'm going to make it look. All right. Questions? Yes. Yes, you can. So, for example, and again, we can, you know, with this one, the example is going to seem pretty contrived, but I could have an article on a day that I had a cold that was also my favorite soccer player's birthday. So, I could assign an ID to it and a class to it. How would then, what rule would it apply? Again, it would go down the list and it would apply the rules, and the more specific rule would win. So, in the case, what do you think is more specific, an ID or a class? An ID, right? Because an ID uniquely identifies something. So, if you had something defined for an ID and a class, I'm pretty sure the ID would win. Because that means that's just you, you know. A class is then next specific, the tag is third specific, and so on down the line. But yeah, you can mix and match. This is where it can, get, it can get confusing, and this is why it's good to spend a little bit of time thinking and planning out the stuff that you're going to do. But you can absolutely have uh, a class and an ID. All right? um, that's true for a couple reasons. One of the reasons is we use the ID for other things as well. All right? We've already seen an example where we create a link to link to an ID. So even if you're not going to style it differently, you might use the ID for something else. But even with styling, you can have a, a class and an ID assigned to an element, and then it gets a mix of those two. All right. Other questions about this? Yes. I just thought it was weird how you had your dot code up there because it put the white in the background. It didn't take it from the article anymore. It took it from the body instead. Um, you know what? I thought that was odd too. I didn't want to discuss it at that point, so I pretended it didn't happen. All right. In a nutshell, I think the I think the issue is the manner in which I defined it because I used a short and I, I've been thinking about it since then. So I'm fortunately ready to answer your question now. I defined it using the shorthand property of background. Boom. All right. Had I used and I'm not going to go and do this, but had I used the long form and said background image, background color background this, I'll bet it would have worked the way that you're expecting. But here I've just defined one background property which is a mix of all these other little mini properties. Great question. Alright, next week we will pick up with directories and we'll get into the project. So, over the weekend read through the project handouts again. I know this will be probably like the third time that you've read through them, right? because I mentioned it the first day of class, I think I mentioned it last class, so I know it's going to be review for you, but do take a second to read the project handouts before class uh, next time. All right, we'll see you over in lab. Um, I'm not sure. But I, I, I don't think that is um, because typically with CSS there is like a clear winner and there's a hierarchy. Yeah. Um, that being said, if you're really interested, go and convert it to be that and, and try and, and see. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I suppose what you said is definitely possible. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, that, that, that could be as well. Why it happens. So right. Like maybe it put them like that article on now, same level, so the next character. Right. Right. Oh, that's a possibility. 